Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, Professor Goga. How are you, Nisha? Hi, thank you. How are you? Good, thanks. Just realized I didn't send you some information that you needed. I can send it to you now if you like. Correct. Okay. So I think, uh, let's look at the time, be two o'clock, we're just admitting everyone into the room and I believe um, all our speakers and discussants are already here. So welcome. So we'll get started in about a minute. All right, um, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for joining us virtually on this lovely Friday afternoon. Um, I'm Nisha Jacob. I'm a public health medicine specialist at the University of Cape Town. Um, this session was unintentionally scheduled at the same time as the Olympics opening ceremony, but we're very glad that you're here and joining us. Um, so part of my work is with MESH, the Measurement and Surveillance of HIV Epidemic Consortium supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the second of a series of MESH EPI meetings. And the aim of these meetings is to spend some time together critically reviewing our HIV data using an epidemiological lens, something that we have limited time to focus on in our busy service-driven work. Um, at our first session in March, we focused on giving an overview of the HIV epidemic in the Western Cape province. And during the discussion at the first meeting, it was felt that our next area of focus should be the role of routine HIV data in pregnancy and vertical transmission, which follows in well from some of the key messages that were highlighted um, at the International AIDS Society conference also held this week. Um, and so we have four very exciting speakers lined up for today, followed by a discussion led by three insightful discussants with much experience in the field of HIV epidemiology. And I will introduce each of our speakers and discussants as we go along. But before we start, just a few quick reminders. Um, please keep your microphone muted um, and your cameras off during the presentations, um, but the, um, the presentations will be approximately 10 minutes each followed by five minutes for questions of clarity. And thereafter, we'll have about an hour for a broader discussion, which will be chaired by Andrew Bull. Should you have any questions in the question and answer time, please use the raise hand function or type your question in the chat. And before you speak, please unmute and put your camera on if you're able to, and please do introduce yourself before you ask your question. Um, so it's great to... Um, to see you all here today and without any further ado I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. Lee Johnson. Lee is an epidemiologist and modeler at the UCT Center for Infectious Diseases Epidemiology and Research. He has a particular interest in integrating epidemiological and demographic data using mathematical modeling. He leads the development of the Tembisa model and the microcosm model and is also a member of the International Epidemiology Databases to Evaluate AIDS Collaboration, the HIV Modeling Consortium, and the UN AIDS Reference Group for Estimates, Modeling, and Projections. Thank you very much, Lee, for joining us again. We really appreciate all your insights, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Nisha, for that introduction. Um, I am trying to uh, share my video, but unfortunately, it's not um, working. So I'm just going to share my screen in the meantime. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Great. Okay, I'm just going to presenter mode. Okay, thanks um, again for the introduction, Nisha, and for inviting me to be here today. I'm going to be speaking today about um, mother to child transmission and pediatric HIV, both nationally and in the Western Cape. Um, and I'm going to be presenting results from the Timbisa model. For those of you who are not familiar with the Timbisa model, Timbisa is 
an integrated HIV and demographic model that we've developed for South Africa and which has been applied nationally and also to each of the provinces in South Africa. So I'm going to start off this presentation with a very brief overview of the Timbisa model and how it is structured. I'll then present our national estimates from Timbisa and I'll then present some more detailed results for the Western Cape and compare the Western Cape with the other provinces. Um, and I'll finish off by talking about um, some of the areas where we need to improve on the Timbisa model. And I just want to acknowledge up front um, that although we are reasonably confident in the Timbisa estimates at a national level, there is still a lot of work that we need to do to improve um, the reliability of the pediatric estimates at a provincial level. Um, so I'll, I'll finish off by talking about some of the areas where we might improve upon our current um, approach. So to give you a very high level overview of the Timbisa model, um, in order to estimate rates of mother to child transmission, we, we need to make assumptions about fertility rates in women living with HIV, rates of uptake of HIV testing and ART in pregnant HIV positive women, and obviously the duration of breastfeeding and also very importantly, the HIV incidence rates in breastfeeding mothers. In order to estimate numbers of children living with HIV, we, we need further assumptions about rates of disease progression and mortality in the absence of treatment, rates of HIV testing and diagnosis in kids, survival after treatment initiation, and also sexual behavior in older children. The next slide is just showing you the structure of our pediatric HIV model. The different columns here are representing different um, steps in the treatment cascade. So the first column is kids who are HIV positive but undiagnosed. The second column is kids who are diagnosed but not yet on ART. And the third column is kids who are on ART. And the different rows um, are representing uh, different risks of disease progression or mortality within each step in the treatment cascade. Uh, so very briefly, we, we are separating out the HIV positive children according to whether they are in early or late disease. And also we separate out the perinatally infected and the postnatally infected kids because the postnatally infected kids have lower rates of HIV disease progression. There are several data sources that we use in calibrating the pediatric component of the Timbisa model. And I've just listed those here in this table. Um, it's important to note that the calibration process is not the same in the national and the provincial versions of the model. So in the last two columns, I've indicated which data sources are used in each. Um, for some data sources like child PIP, um, we just don't have the data disaggregated at provincial level. For other data sources like the NHLS data on the age distribution of kids on ART, we do actually have the data, it's just we haven't yet got round to um, updating our calibration algorithms to include those province specific data. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to show you how the model estimates at the national level compare with um, various data sources. Here we're looking at HIV prevalence in kids. The dots are representing the data from the HSRC household surveys. The solid line represents the average of the best fitting model estimates and the dashed lines represent the 95% confidence intervals. Uh, and you can see that the model results are fairly consistent with the first three surveys, um, but lower than the level of prevalence that was measured in the 2017 HSRC survey. Here we're looking at HIV prevalence in children tested around two months of age. The data that are shown here weren't actually used in calibration, but nevertheless, the model results are fairly consistent with these data. Although I should point out that the NHLS data in blue um, before 2008 um, are not really reliable because this was before early infant diagnosis was rolled out on any large scale. And before 2008, most of the PCR testing that was done in kids was being done in kids who were symptomatic, who were su suspected to have a high risk of HIV. So it wasn't really representative of um, all kids um, who were HIV exposed. Here we're looking at total deaths in children um, and you can see that the model results are fairly consistent with the rise in recorded deaths in the early 2000s and then the uh, significant drop off in mortality after 2004 following the rollout of PMTCT and also um, pediatric ART. 
Um, I mentioned the child PIP data, and what I'm showing you here is the fraction of deaths with an HIV positive diagnosis, the dots representing the, the child PIP data. Uh, and these are useful because they tell us something about levels of HIV diagnosis in HIV positive children. I'm now going to move on to present some of the results for the Western Cape. Um, so the first Uh, Sorry, it seems I was unmuted there. I don't know what happened. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry about that, Lee. I'm not sure what happened there. Okay. Um, so in this next slide, um, we're just looking at HIV prevalence in pregnant women in the Western Cape. Um, you can see the model results are fairly consistent with the data. Sorry, I'm struggling to progress with the slides. Sorry, I don't actually know what's happened here. I, I can't seem to um, progress my slides. Um, Lee, do you want to maybe stop sharing and then try sharing again? I'll try that. Okay, can you see my screen again? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Okay, so we're back to the same slide. Let's, okay, there we are progressing. Great. Okay, um, so in the next slide, we're looking at HIV prevalence in kids in the Western Cape. Um, the dots are representing, again, the data from the HSRC survey. And you can see um, these data points have extremely wide confidence intervals around them. So there's actually not a lot that we can tell from the HSRC survey data. Here we're looking at um, data on numbers of children on ART in the Western Cape. And I show you this with some trepidation because the model results clearly don't fit the data very well, particularly in the, in the period before 2008. Um, but at least in the period after 2014, uh, the model results are fairly consistent with the routine program data from the province. Here we're looking at the proportion of children on ART in different age groups. Um, and the data that are shown here um, are from the NHLS. Um, this is data collected by Mary Maskew and um, colleagues at, at HERO. Um, we haven't actually used the data in calibration, but the model results are nevertheless fairly consistent with the data. So what you can see in red is that over time, the proportion of um, pediatric ART patients who are in the 10 to 14 year old age group has increased quite substantially. Um, and Coinciding with that, there's been a steep decline in the proportion uh, in the 0 to 4 age groups in, in dark blue. Um, here we're looking again at uh, routine data on rapid HIV tests in children in the Western Cape. Um, again, the data that are shown here are not data that we've used in calibrating the model. Um, and that is why the model results don't line up very closely with the data. Um, it appears that the model is slightly overestimating um, the HIV testing yields for, for children in the Western Cape. So in the next few slides, we're just going to compare Western Cape with the other provinces. Uh, firstly, we're looking here at trends in mother-to-child transmission rates over time. Um, mother-to-child transmission rates here are defined as all cases of mother-to-child transmission divided by um, the numbers of births to HIV positive mothers in each year. Um, and you can see that the decline in mother to child transmission um, was much faster and much earlier in the Western Cape than in the other provinces, which is because the PMTCT program started earlier um, in the province and also was different. The protocols in the Western Cape were different from those in the rest of the country. Um, but in recent years, uh, the Western Cape mother-to-child transmission rates are pretty similar to the, the national average, um, around 4% in recent years. That 4% might seem um, unexpected to those of you who are more familiar with um, the, the routine PMTCT program data. So I think it's helpful to break that 4% that down. Um, here we're looking at um, the sources of mother-to-child transmission. So the dark blue bars here represent 
transmission that occurred at or before birth. The light blue represents postnatal transmission from HIV diagnosed mothers up to 18 months. And the pink represents other postnatal transmission, which is almost entirely transmission from mothers who seroconverted during breastfeeding. Um, and you can see that's quite a substantial fraction of all the mother to child transmission. It's obviously very difficult to, to measure that in our routine data. What we pick up in our routine data is mostly the dark blue bar. And sometimes if we're lucky, we are able to measure the lighter blue bar, um, but uh, we don't really have routine data on um, the, the postnatal transmission from the mothers who seroconvert during breastfeeding. Um, looking at HIV prevalence in children, Western Cape has the lowest HIV prevalence, which is not surprising because um, HIV prevalence in pregnant women is lower in the Western Cape than in the other provinces. Um, but it's also partly because of the success of the um, PMTTT program in the province um, and the early rollout that I mentioned earlier. Here we're looking at um, pediatric ART coverage in 2020. Again, the Western Cape is fairly close to the national average. Uh, and here we're looking at trends in under five mortality. Um, Western Cape has consistently had the lowest under five mortality in the country. Um, and, and that's partly because relative levels of non-HIV mortality are uh, relatively low in, in the Western Cape um, compared to the other provinces. Uh, so what I've presented here today is a, a fairly kind of warts and all um, summary of the Tembisa pediatric estimates in the Western Cape. Uh, there are many opportunities to improve on um, the results. And I've, I've shown you a number of cases where the model results don't line up as closely with the data as we would like. Um, this is not just a problem with the Western Cape. There are actually several provinces where we struggle to get the model um, fitting the data. Um, and so we need to do further work in terms of including um, data on the age distribution of children. Lee, uh, I think you're muted again. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. I've unmuted myself and stopped sharing. I'm gonna share again. Okay, can you hear me yes. and see my slides? Okay, yes, we good. can. Sorry about that, Lee. Okay, um, yeah, so I don't know how much you heard on what I was saying, but I was basically just saying here that there are, um, that we do need to improve the, the, um, the provincial model estimates, not just for the Western Cape, but for, for several of the provinces where um, the model estimates don't always line up very closely with the data. So we're planning to include in the calibration process uh, data on the age distribution of kids on ART from the NHLS, um, the HIV testing yield data, um, and also possibly recorded deaths. Um, another data source that we could potentially incorporate, which is kind of unique to the Western Cape, is the data on the proportion of HIV positive pregnant women who are on ART before conception. Um, these data are actually in the DHS, but DHIS, but we haven't included them in the calibration because we don't think they are reliably recorded. Um, it's, it's basically self-report. When women come for their first antenatal visit, they're asked are you already on ART and, and the self reporting we think is very unreliable. Um, but for the Western Cape with the linkage of um, patient records across facilities, we think the, the data should actually be more reliable. And so we'd like to explore the possibility of using these data. Um, and I just wanna finish by reflecting on what these results imply for HIV services in the Western Cape. Um, firstly, compared to other provinces uh, the recent MTCT rates from HIV positive mothers look fairly similar to the national average. Similarly, the levels of pediatric ART coverage in the Western Cape look pretty close to the national average. Um, it is important to say though that across all provinces, 
the levels of HIV diagnosis and treatment coverage in kids are much lower than those in adults. And so across all provinces, we need to do more to improve pediatric HIV testing, particularly in older children. Um, and also we need to do more to improve linkage uh, from HIV diagnosis to treatment initiation. Um, and that brings me to a, an end. I just wanna thank everyone who's given input on the pediatric component of the Tembisa model. Um, and if you've, you, you are interested in finding out more about the model, please do check out our website, timbisa.org. Um, there's also a paper that we published last year in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal, which describes the model in, in more detail. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lee, for that fantastic presentation. It was very clear and insightful. You're getting a few virtual claps. Um, I'm not sure if you can see that. And uh, sincere apologies for the technical glitches. Um, I think we have time for one quick question. If there's any questions of clarity, just we will have a broader discussion afterwards, but if there's any questions of clarity, please feel free um, to raise your hand. Um, I see there's a, there's a question in the chat, um, Lee, um, from Karen Jennings for postnatal transmission. Um, seroconverted during breastfeeding, but also known HIV positive, but never on art or off art or on art, but viral load not suppressed. Is the split modeled? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, um, Karen, do you want yeah. to? <laughs> Hi there. Uh, Nisha, shall I just try and, <laughs> sorry, maybe it's not very clear. Um, Lee, thanks very much. I think I heard you talking about the postnatal transmission and the um, underlying reason for that being seroconversion during breastfeeding, but presumably also not only seroconversion during breastfeeding, but those other categories. So, you know, known HIV positive, never on art or had been on art, but now off or still on art, but viral load not suppressed. And I just wondered the, the different categories responsible for postnatal transmission if that's being modeled. Okay, thanks, Karen, for, for that explanation. Yeah, so that, that is in the model. Um, we do take into account the different um, ways in which transmission can occur. Um, it's, it's not obviously in, in what I presented, but we can calculate those outputs. I'm sorry, I don't have the results at hand, but it is something we can we can um, display. Thanks very much, Lee. And, and thank you, Karen, for clarifying the question. Um, so I'd just like to say a very big thank you to Lee for again coming and really presenting some a fantastic presentation um, and very interesting um, results. Thank you for that, Lee. Um, and I'd like to now hand over to our next speaker, who is Faith Moyo. Faith is an epidemiologist at the Center for HIV and Sexually Transmitted Infections within the National Institute for Communicable Diseases in South Africa. In this role, Faith is responsible for pediatric HIV surveillance, monitoring early infant diagnosis and linkage to care within the national PMTCT program in South Africa, and is also involved in operational and clinical HIV research focused on evaluating the performance of new and existing models of HIV care to inform health policy and overall strengthening of health systems in South Africa. Thank you very much for joining us, Faith. Over to you. I know, Faith, you were having some difficulty with your camera as well, um, but feel free to share your screen. Okay, thanks, Nietzsche, for the introduction. I'm just gonna try and share my, sli my slides. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to present uh, findings from some of the work that we're doing at the NICD. So today I'll be talking about maternal viral load and pediatric HIV monitoring within the National PMTCD program. And this is uh, evidence from routine laboratory data. So Sorry, the information in this slide, yes. Are you able to put it on um, presenter view? Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the information is in this slide is 
pretty much um, common to people in this audience, but as a way of introduction, I'm just going to briefly talk about PMTCT in South Africa. So one in three pregnant women is HIV positive in South Africa, and this translates to about 260,000 HIV exposed neonates per annum. And antiretroviral therapy, ART, is the main strategy for preventing mother's child transmission of HIV. So within our, set, within our settings, uh, the risk of mother to child transmission of HIV ranges between 15 and ranges between 15 to 45 percent in the absence of ART. However, when ART is used, the risk of mother to child transmission of HIV reduces to less than 5 percent. And we know that HIV screening and ART coverage rates, sorry, we know that HIV screening and ART coverage rates. Um, a near universal in the public sector at more than 95% coverage. So South Africa has committed to eliminating mother to child transmission of HIV. However, despite the significant progress in reducing mother to child transmission of HIV, <coughs> excuse me, um, achieving EMTCT will not be an easy win for South Africa. We know that the program battles high rates of seroconversion in pregnancy and during the breastfeeding period. And uh, in order to achieve EMTCT, um, maternal viral loads need to be sustained at less than 50 copies per mil during pregnancy and the breastfeeding period. However, there's poor viral load monitoring during pregnancy and postpartum within the program. And also currently there's limited data that provides a national picture of viral load outcomes of pregnant and postpartum women living with HIV. Uh, there is some evidence from localized and smaller cross-sectional studies that describe maternal viral load outcomes. And these data mostly come from the Western Cape. But we also know that uh, there's geospatial differences in the response to the HIV epidemic in the country. And therefore findings from the Western Cape may not be generalizable um, countrywide. And so with this in mind, we conducted a retrospective cohort analysis of longitudinal viral load data belonging to, the, to a synthetic cohort of pregnant women created from centralized routine laboratory data from the NHLS CDW uh, corporate data warehouse. We included women living with HIV who were aged 15 to 49 years who were pregnant and delivered between the years 2016 and 2018. And these women had to have received an HIV, an HIV laboratory test at any public health facility in the country during the study period. And because there's no marker for pregnancy within the warehouse, uh, pregnant women were identified by a syphilis screening test coupled with either a creatinine clearance and a steady four count or a viral load test. And this was according to maternity care guidelines as well as national HIV treatment guidelines for pregnant women living with HIV. We included all women that met the status inclusion criteria. So we managed to identify just under 180,000 pregnant women living with HIV from the NHLS uh, CDW. All the provinces were represented and the majority came from Kauteng province and was in Natal. Um, and at the, first, at the first antenatal care visit, median maternal, maternal age was 29.2 years and there was an even split of ART experienced and ART naive women uh, at the first international care visit. And amongst those that were ART experienced, 43% of the women had a viral load greater than 50 copies per meal. And amongst women initiating ART during pregnancy, two thirds still had a viral load greater than 50 copies per meal after three months of ART use. And overall, we observed a decreasing trend in proportions of viremic women from 53% uh, at the first antenatal care visit to 37% at delivery and 20% during postpartum. So this slide shows uh, a graphical description of the evolution of maternal viral load during the study period for this synthetic cohort. And we can see from uh, the graph, from graph A, that there was a general decline in maternal viral loads from the time that women entered the PMTCT program through delivery up until the end of the postpartum period. However, there was a slight increase in um, maternal viremia for women that initiated ART during pregnancy. 
And uh, for graph B, we noted that uh, there was a constant proportion of women that were viremic uh, during follow-up. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, check to see if these were the same women or different women throughout follow-up. And in terms of predictors of uh, maternal viral load decline, we noted that uh, maternal viral load decline was predicted by longer duration on ART, older maternal age greater than 25 years, and having a CD4 count greater than 500 at the first antenatal care visit. So this slide shows uh, the burden of maternal viremia at the time of delivery during uh, for the synthetic cohort between 2016 and 2018. And we noted provincial differences uh, in, maternal, uh, in maternal viremia at the time of delivery with the best performing provinces or districts in KwaZulu-Natal, the Western Cape and Free State, and uh, suboptimal performance in districts that were in Limpopo province, in the Eastern Cape, as well as uh, Gauteng province. And this is using both thresholds of greater than 50 copies per mil or, or at greater than 1,000 copies per mil at the time of delivery. Slide shows uh, more recent data, and basically it's uh, a description of viral loads that we associated with um, electronic gatekeeping codes for maternal viral loads during pregnancy and the postpartum period in the NHLS warehouse. So we know that uh, in 2019, the PMTCT guidelines made provision for national surveillance of maternal viral loads uh, during pregnancy and the postpartum period by introdu introducing electronic gatekeeping codes um, CH, PMTCT, and CH uh, delivery to try and distinguish maternal viral load testing at uh, the different time points for, during pregnancy and postnatally. So we extracted viral loads that we associated with this electronic gatekeeping codes from the warehouse and uh, described uh, viral load suppression uh, for the period of Jan to June 2021. And we can see from the first graph, uh, which is showing viral loads less than 50 copies per mil, that uh, approximately 68% of women had a viral load less than 50 copies per mil during the antenatal period. Uh, and this increased to um, about 74% during the time of delivery. And when we use the threshold of less than a thousand copies, viral loads less than a thousand copies per mil, we noted that um, approximately 85% of uh, women had a viral load um, greater than a thousand copies. And uh, at delivery, a similar proportion was noted at the time of delivery. So we can see that this is an, incre uh, this is an increase in uh, viral load suppression amongst pregnant women when compared to results of the synthetic code that I presented, in, uh, that I presented on earlier on. However, in order to achieve uh, the 390 and EMTCT, there's need to strengthen adherence to ART to increase viral load monitoring and rapid reaction to high maternal viral loads. This slide uh, shows uh, pediatric HIV diagnosis uh, at national and provincial level for the years 2019 to 2021. And um, currently the intrauterine transmission rate um, has remained at less than 1% over the three year period. And this translates to about 200 cases per 100,000 live births. Um, and during the postnatal period, um, transmission rates are estimated to be 1.5 times to two times the IU rate nationally. And then in terms of EID case rates, the way so the EID case rates were calculated as the number of PCR positive children from the NHLS CDW, um, the 100,000 live births from the DHIS, from the DHIS. And we noted a steady decline in national in the national EID case rates from about 800 to less to about 700 per 100,000 live births between 2019 and 2021. However, there is greater variation at provincial level. So this slide uh, shows the number of HIV PCR positive children and EID case rates uh, from birth to the end of the breastfeeding period from Jan to June 2021. And just to mention that currently the top five districts with the highest EID case rates, are uh, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, Bujanala, Bujanala Platinum, Nelson Mandela Bay, Ngangala and Ethazeni districts. 
Just to comment on the strengths and limitations of the NHLS data. So the data comes from routinely collected um, data from within the National PMCT program. So this provides insights into the evolution of actual maternal viral loads as, op as opposed to clinical trial study populations. And the data is reported nationally and sub subnationally. And therefore, this allows for provincial and district level evaluations. And we do have large sample size. So this minimizes potential bias. However, um, there's some limitations with regards to NHLS data. For example, for the synthetic cohort that I presented on, there was no marker for there is no marker for pregnancy in the in the NHLS warehouse. The, um, therefore, the findings were based on a synthetic cohort, and uh, the findings may not be generalizable to pregnant women in the entire country. But when we compared our results with uh, findings from similar work, for instance, the 2017 ANC survey, the results were comparable. And this suggested to us that our synthetic code was uh, representative of um, pregnant women living with HIV in the country. Um, and the viral load data that I presented on that is associated with maternal EG EGK codes, uh, it might not be representative of all women in the country because uh, completion of EGK codes is very poor in the field. And the data that is presented is based on very small um, numbers, as you saw in the slide, if I can just go back. Uh, for example, in the antenatal pre period, we found about 3,000 to 9,000 viral loads per month that were associated with EGK codes and the delivery, this was about 3,000 to 5,000 5, viral loads per month. Sorry. Um, and then regarding the EID case rates, um, the estimates are dependent on the accuracy of the NHLS CDW algorithm to deduplicate test level data, as well as the accuracy of uh, DHIS total live birth data. And just to say overall, there is no unique identifier in the NHLS CDW. Therefore, record linkage relies on probabilistic matching of patient demographics. So this may under or overestimate uh, viral load suppression rates. Thank you. I'd like to thank my colleagues for their support. Uh, the NHLS for providing the data and the ELMA and UNICEF for finding some of the work that is presented here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faith. You're also getting lots of virtual applause. Um, thanks for an excellent presentation, which I think ties in um, very well with our with our next presentation that I'll, um, I'll introduce the speaker just now. I think we have time to squeeze one question in. Any questions of clarity? Um, okay, I see Kim Anderson has popped a question in the chat room. Um, apologies if I missed this, but how was maternal art history determined? So, so we looked at for women that are ART experienced, we looked uh, uh, retrospectively to see if they had a viral load that was performed uh, prior to inclusion in the, in the study. And so we assumed that if you didn't have any prior viral loads, then you, you, you were not on ART. And then, yeah. Thanks very much, Faith. Um, Kim, does, does that clarify? Yes, thanks very much. Great. Um, if there are no further questions of clarity, I think we can move on to our next speaker. I'd just like to say a very big thank you to Faith for that great presentation and really links in very well to our third speaker for today, and that's Dr. Alexa Heeks. Alexa is a senior data analyst, analyst and technical lead at the Provincial Health Data Center at the Western Cape Department of Health. Um, those of you who are at our first session will remember that um, Alexa did pr uh, present briefly then as well. And over the past six years, Alexa has led many of the data integration activities and inference of health conditions from the routine health data harmonized by the Western Cape Provincial Health Data Center. Thank you very much for joining us, Alexa. I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Nisha. I'm gonna share my screen. Great. Can you see my slide? Thank, yes, we can. Thanks, Alexa. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Today, I will be demonstrating the utility of a patient level PMCCT cascade developed from routine health data in the Western Cape. 
Just um, as an outline, I'll start off with a brief background to the Provincial Health Data Center, as well as our HIV episodes and cascades and pregnancy episodes and cascades, and then how we've constructed a PMTCT cascade. Um, I will touch on some comparison to the model that Lee presented, as well as um, give some insight to some PMTCT indicators for the province based on the data we've integrated, and then finally provide a example of um, actionable data use. So if you were at the previous meeting, this um, will be very familiar, so I'll make it quite brief. But just to give some background to the um, Provincial Health Data Centre in the Western Cape. In the Western Cape province, we have a unique health identifier called the folder number, which is used across all facilities and captured into the various routine um, information systems, which allows us to um, link data for patients across um, different systems and different kinds of data types. And at the data center, we integrate all these different kinds of data um, almost daily for every source. There are a few sources which come a little bit less frequently than daily and some which come throughout the day. And this allows our data to be very actionable. And with all this um, information, like hospital information, disease registers, lab data, and drug tests, emergency services, visits, et cetera, we're able to try and infer health conditions as well as service encounters. I'm going to give some information as to how we do this for HIV and pregnancy. Um, for uh, our HIV episode, which is basically just inferring anybody in the province who is HIV positive, we use various pieces of evidence from the different sources. Our biggest sources are obviously the treatment registers that we have, such as tier.net, um, PHCIS and Premise, which are the primary care sites. Um, but we also use other evidence from laboratory tests, um, drug dispensing, any ICD-10 codes uh, within hospital services, et cetera, to try and identify if somebody could be HIV positive. And we grade the episodes that we infer based on the amount and kinds of evidence that we receive. We roll up all of this evidence into a single line per patient episode, which contains all the key information such as the episode start date, um, treatment start date, last dates of contact, and all the evidence that we use to ascertain that episode. And we can also then assign each episode a confidence score, which we can use for quick filtering of um, episodes that are probably too weak to be considered um, definite positives. And then with the HIV episode, we are able to combine other key indicators such as comorbidities, um, TB treatment, uh, regimens, last viral loads, et cetera, all into a patient level um, clinical care cascade, which can then be used um, by people in the services. We do something quite similar for pregnancies where um, in, with the exception of a few smaller registers, we don't have province-wise registers of pregnancies. So we use evidence from laboratory testing as well as maternity and obstetric unit visits and various other pieces of evidence to infer pregnancy episodes. And these similarly get rolled up into um, one line per pregnancy as a patient can have multiple pregnancies in their lifetime into a um, into pregnancy episodes, which then get combined with comorbidities and infant details, um, things like congenital anomalies, teratogen exposures, um, hypertension status, delivery information, gestational age where we can ascertain it. And all of this gets combined into what we call the maternal cascade, which can be used to follow up on um, the mothers as well as the children up until two years of age. We then combine the HIV cascade and the maternal cascade into what we call the PMTCT cascade. And this contains one line per patient with all infants that were born to HIV positive mothers. In the future, it will also include uh, HIV positive infants where we have no pregnancy details, but we're just busy um, working through all of those um, babies to ensure that they're not actually duplicates um, who've appeared on, on different folder numbers since they were born. Um, from the maternal cascade, we bring through key um, mother and infant details and outcome details and birth weight and things like that. And from the HIV cascade, we bring through things like the um, treatment dates, the evidence dates, viral loads, CD4 counts and infant testing over time. And then we also incorporate things like IPT exposure and TB, and TB status. Comparing the data that we've combined to the um, 
model of HIV prevalence in pregnant women, you'll see that our numbers from 2015 align quite closely. Um, and I've just projected it further than um, with our real numbers um, after 2015. The reason we've only included numbers from 2015 is that's when um, routine health information systems really have quite good coverage across the province. Before that, the data is quite reliable, but not to give a provincial um, outlook. Um, just some summary indicators from the PMTCT cascade analysis. So this includes, um, the, uh, this slide and slides to follow include all um, HIV positive um, pregnancies and, and in general pregnancies inferred between April 2019 and March 2020. So, um, we had about 18.8% of all of those pregnancies um, where that were live births um, being in women with HIV. Of those 16,566 live births, um, 80, almost 88% of those mothers received art during their pregnancy. Um, also of those live births, uh, about 84% of the infants were tested by 10 weeks. And um, by 24 months, 2.3% of those infants had tested positive. This slide just breaks down into um, quite a lot of detail, the different pregnancy outcomes um, based on all pregnancies, pregnancies in the PMTCT program, which are defined as any pregnancies where the mother's HIV status was ascertained prior to delivery, as well as um, in mothers where they were either HIV positive prior to delivery or within two years of the outcome. And uh, maybe just to highlight the live births in the PMTCT program, we estimated to be 16,577 in total, of which about 16,083 or 97% could be linked to a PMI. So we had a folder number for the infants that we could then use to um, look at their data after birth. Um, and compared to the DHIS number for live births, um, it's, it's a little bit lower, but this is to be expected as we try and improve our ascertainment of, of births and linkage to mothers. Looking at the infant's HIV status, um, so of the 16,500 um, mothers who were on the PMTCT program where an infant could be linked regardless of their outcome, so this includes live births, stillbirths and neonatal deaths where there's an infant link, um, about 87% of them had a known HIV status for the baby. Of those with a known HIV status, about 1.9% tested HIV positive. Um, in addition to the 278 that tested positive in the PMTCT program, another 100 infants were um, off program tested positive, and I'll break these down in the next slide. Um, just to compare to DHIS, the numbers are a little bit higher um, for the birth and 10 week, and the total as well, because our HIV positive total goes up until 24 months, where the HIV positive total in DHIS only goes up to 10 weeks. Um, the biggest uh, contributor to the difference is, is probably the time period. So for our HIV positive at birth indicator, we include any test done between birth and 10 weeks. And at 10 weeks, it's any test done between 10 weeks and six months. Um, so that could in, in explain a bit of an increase as well as the fact that ours include HIV positive um, from any source, not just PCR. And there might be some babies where we have other testing information. Just to break down the infant's HIV status by the mother's HIV status, um, in, on the left, about 27% of the total HIV positive infants were off program. 46% of them um, that were also on program were um, on art prior to pregnancy. Um, it would be useful for us to break this pie up out into ones that continue to take art during pregnancy because there are some moms who may have been on art prior to pregnancy but um, had interruptions during and this is something we can do in future analyses and then looking uh, in more detail at the off program hiv positive infants by the mother's status um, you'll see that 45 percent of them had hiv ascertained postnatally and art started postnatally and nine percent um, had hiv ascertained postnatally and never started art 
just to look at um, testing patterns and, and diagnosis methods for the infants. Um, around 97% of the infants that were linked to the PMTCT program were tested at at least one of the time points according to the guidelines. Uh, 272 or 1.7% testing um, positive um, at any of the time points. Um, 44, uh, just less than 44% of those testing positive um, via their birth PCR and an additional 25% of the 10 week PCR and the rest thereafter. Then just to look at the transmission proportions as a summary, each of these methods uses, um, you'll see from the numbers presented quite different um, numerators and, and denominators, and they maybe answer slightly different questions. But to look at the PMTCT program only, um, we would estimate about 1.9% transmission up until 24 months, or 278 infants out of the 14,454 where we have a status ascertained. Um, when we look at all mothers who were HIV positive up until 24 months um, post delivery, we have 378 infants, um, which equates to about 2.3% transmission. When we look at the DHIS numbers, which only go up till 10 weeks and include um, a larger denominator of all infants born on the PMTCT program, it equates to about 0.9%. And when we look at Lee's model estimates, um, in overall, it would be 3.93 or close to 4% total um, transmission. But um, before 18 months, it would be about 2.14%, which uh, aligns quite nicely with the PMTCT program and all mothers' transmission proportions. Uh, finally, just to look at how these data can be used at a, at a patient level and they're not just um, aggregate numbers, we have a system of alerting various recipients in the province that have agreed to um, take action on different kinds of data points. And one of these alerts is of PCR positive infants. And this is an example that was sent out in a password protected email. Um, it contains the infant's folder number um, a link to our single patient viewer, which is an application developed by the Provincial Health Data Center that displays um, all the patient's information that was ever captured electronically for them. So I'm going to just give you a, a quick look into how that um, looks. So when you click that link, it takes you to the um, infant's dashboard. And on their dashboard, you can see their inferred health conditions, any um, encounters or visits to the service, uh, lab tests, appointments, as well as drugs, which are just cut off in this um, screenshot. Um, but just to look at some of the things that I've highlighted, you can see when the HIV positive episode was inferred. And although the date of birth is hidden because of their um, of it being in demo mode, um, it, it aligns with this date. You can also see visits um, just a few weeks later um, at the pediatric ARV clinic at a children's hospital. You can click through to um, the patient's administrative details to try and see if there are any links to their mother. And in this case, there was a link to the mother. So then you can click on the mother's fold number and view her dashboard. And here you can see um, her pregnancy episode and her HIV positive episode. And you can see the HIV positive um, status was known um, almost two years prior to their first evidence of pregnancy. You can also very quickly see the viral load at delivery um, in the lab data, as well as their admission to the, um, for the pregnancy. In terms of the pregnancy details, you can um, click on the pregnancy episode to view various details that were um, captured about that pregnancy. And um, this patient is actually part of the pregnancy exposure registry, which um, our colleague will present um, data from in the next presentation. So you can see quite a lot of detailed information that's been captured about any exposures to drugs or alcohol or smoking and that kind of thing, as well as um, art related uh, data. You can also view details about the delivery and um, see any, any complications that might be useful, whether the, the mother was dispensed art. Um, but possibly most useful in this um, case is to look at the mother's HIV journey um, electronically or as it's been captured electronically. And um, at the top, we have three lines of um, 
patient episodes, starting with the pregnancy episode and then at the bottom, the HIV episode. And just to note for the pregnancy episode, there's a, a light, um, lighter bar for the time where we didn't know electronically that they were pregnant, but we can infer that they were pregnant um, for that period based on their delivery date. And um, you'll see that prior to the pregnancy, this um, woman was quite consistent on the art and even during pregnancy, according to the electronic data, they were receiving art, uh, their viral load was suppressed. And then during pregnancy, the viral load um, goes up. So around about the time of conception, they were changed over onto to a dolutegravir regimen. Um, and at delivery, the viral load was quite elevated. And um, yeah, in this case, in interaction with the patient to understand whether or not they were taking their meds would be quite useful just to see what uh, could have gone um, wrong in this case. Just to summarize, um, we have a lot of rich data that has been routinely generated and collected at a patient level, and there are um, a lot of opportunities to refine our existing um, episode algorithms to increase accuracy and coverage. And with all this um, very rich data, we can do a lot more analyses on exposures during various trimesters, viral suppression as well. Um, and these are currently in the pipeline. Various um, aggregate cascades are also being developed that I haven't been able to present today. Um, but at a patient level, they have been combined into actionable cascades um, that can be aggregated to calculate useful indicators for management. Thank you so much to everyone for listening and a huge thanks to my colleagues, especially Vanessa Timmerman and Florence for working on the PMTCD data so hard um, for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexa. That was a fantastic presentation. It was really clear um, and very, um, really amazing work that you and the PhDC team have been um, doing. Thanks very much. And you are getting quite a lot of congratulations in the, the chat as well on the remarkable work and it being a wonderful example of data working for public health immediate benefit. Um, that's from Linda Gale Becker and Marianne Davies. Um, so thank you for that fantastic presentation, Alexa. I think in the interest of time, if I can just ask everyone to hold on to any questions and comments for now, and we'll just have our final presenter and then we can move on to the broader discussion. Um, so thank you, Alexa. And I'd now like to um, introduce our final speaker for today. Last but never least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ushma Mehta. Ushma is a senior researcher at the University of Cape Town Center for Infectious Diseases, Epidemiology and Research, supporting the Western Cape Pregnancy Registry. She is also co-PI of the National Pregnancy Exposure Registry Project, Ubomi Bufle. She is also a board member of SAPRA, the South African Health Products Regulatory Agency. So over to you, Ushma. Hi, um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thanks. Um, uh, I only, only problem is that I can't seem to see my slides. Uh, is, is, have you put my slides on? Uh, um, would you like me to share your slides, Ushma? Yeah, please. Uh, unless people can see my slides, sorry. We can't see anything. Um, so let me just, I'll share your latest um, slides. Yeah, thanks. Oh gosh. So Ushma, you can just indicate to me when you want me to transition slides. Thanks. Um, right. Great, thanks Nisha. Uh, so good, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, present briefly on the pregnancy exposure registry project that was started in the Western Cape in 2016. Next slide please Nisha. It, um, you know, the issue of safe monitoring the safety and performance of antiretrovirals in pregnancy has, uh, has been an ongoing one in South Africa. Um, earlier in 2010, we saw that the National Confidential Inquiry into Maternal Deaths found that many and, uh, um, maternal deaths were associated with nevirapine toxicity, and that was definitely one of the um, reasons why we switched to efavirenz uh, fixed drug combination, among others, of course, but really uh, subsequently concerns about the safety of efavirenz in pregnancy um, resulted in the launch of a national initiative, which was 
uh, started in, in KwaZulu-Natal province, where a pregnancy exposure registry was launched uh, to monitor the safety of efavirenz based treatments, recognizing also that there was an ongoing need for, the, for monitoring the safety of new antiretrovirals in pregnancy. Uh, that uh, due to funding issues, the KwaZulu-Natal project uh, was suspended for a while, but uh, at this, in 2013, the, the plan was also to uh, expand this project across other provinces, but never quite got off the ground. Uh, but with thanks to the grant, the B positive grant funded by the NICD, um, sorry, the NHLS, oh dear, NIH, um, there was the launch of the Guguletu registry site in 2016, in September 2016. Uh, University of Stellenbosch launched uh, their site in 2018, and the data was combined uh, to strengthen the, the number, the sample size of the pregnancy registry in the Western Cape. The concerns raised in 2018 about neural tube defects uh, associated with dolutegravir again strengthened uh, the resolve of National Deva Department of Health to resurrect this a registry project. Um, and despite fading, um, the fading signal, there was clear recognition that we needed to continue monitoring the safety of medicines in pregnancy, particularly those used on a, a large scale, and hence the launch of the National Pregnancy Registry, Ubomi Bushle, which uh, began last year, and really has included the Western Cape project. Next slide. So the Western Cape pregnancy registry sites, which I'll be presenting data on, um, included includes the Google to maternity unit, uh, seeing about 5,000 enrollments a year, uh, and first antenatal visits. And the Worcester site seeing about 3,500 antenatal bookings per year. Next slide. The, plan uh, for ensuring sustainability uh, um, was to embed this registry into in routine care completely. So the primary data source uh, for the registry is only routine clinical records. So this is not a parallel surveillance system, which would not be sustainable and far more costly, particularly given the need for health system strengthening uh, within, within this context and improving uh, exposure ascertainments as part of routine care as well as outcome ascertainment. So the, the, uh, the approach that was used in the Western Cape was to really strengthen the existing health system, uh, training the nurses to do proper record keeping and to record uh, and conduct proper surface examinations at birth while uh, ensuring that there's complete capture of these clinical records into the registry. And next slide. So the, the way the system works is that um, information is captured from the maternity case record across the pregnancy and that at delivery, when the, the maternity case record is left at the delivery facility, the remaining data, particularly of subsequent antenatal visits is captured into a pregnancy and neonatal module, which are linked by the maternal and infant um, uh, folder numbers, uh, which in, in the Western Cape uh, allows us to embed that data directly into the PHDC uh, network. Next slide. So the benefit of this is that firstly, the, the data is kept securely um, on the provincial server. It is embedded in the maternity cascade and is enriches the maternity cascade with more granular clinical data for those pregnancies. And of course, allows for a more enriched Sentinel registry extract, which includes data derived from the NHLS, from the pharmacy management system, as well as uh, Clinicom and, and PHCIS. So this really reduces the amount of data that needs to be collected per client 
and and um, leverages the maternity cascade environment to uh, get more quality uh, data. Next slide. So just in this preliminary analysis, uh, which includes data that's been collected until last week, um, we have 30,000 women enrolled to date in the pregnancy registry in the Western Cape. And the, next to that is the breakdown per year. Um, and some, and of course, we started quite late and we're not sure whether we just haven't completed data collection or whether this is really a drop in enrollments at the facility in 2020 because of COVID. But um, there has definitely also been disruptions in our data collection during COVID. We excluded those who transferred out, those who were subsequently found to not be pregnant, or for those who have no outcome yet, either because they haven't delivered or because they were lost to follow up. So of those who have, for whom we have no outcome, 7% uh, had an estimated end of, uh, or estimated end date or uh, estimated due date of, 30, up, um, of before 1st of June. So some of those cases we haven't yet, captured the outcomes from the clinical records, but some may be genuinely lost to follow up. But, in, but usefully, we have information on the outcome for about three of that 7% um, so, uh, in the PHDC. So the mater uh, maternal age less than 13, there were 15 cases that were also excluded. Um, so the cohort had a infection rate, uh, HIV infection rate of 30%. Next slide. And this is really just a breakdown of the demographics by HIV status of the women who were included in this analysis. What I'd just like to highlight here is that we're able to collect information on uh, smoking, alcohol, and illicit drug use, but also other drug exposures including over-the-counter medication, if it's recorded in the maternity case record. And, and um, fortunately, we have quite high rates of gestational scans at the site, which allows us to do better quality gestational dating uh, analysis. Next slide. So this slide is based on data largely derived from the Provincial Health Data Center, but also augmented by data collected by the, um, the data captures at the facility. HIV, um, of the 7,986 HIV infected women, some, uh, many, or at least a, a small proportion actually, uh, didn't receive antiretrovirals during the course of the pregnancy. Um, of the remaining, we were able to use case definitions developed by Gaia on trimesters of exposure, trimesters um, uh, of pregnancy to establish the proportion of women who were exposed to a particular antiretroviral during their first trimester, second and third trimester and pre-pregnancy. So these columns are cumulative as you go towards the right. And as you can see, we've already got quite a few where we're building um, a, a bank of uh, in, information on dilutegravir exposures in pregnancy. Concurrently, we were able to select, we have selected a list of known teratogens, which have been flagged in the, in the Provincial Health Data Center. So that the prescriptions of these drugs in, these, in this court of women are, uh, are checked for exposures during pregnancy. And as you can see, there are quite a high proportion of potentially teratogenic medications being used concurrently in pregnancy. But some of them may not be teratogenic in that particular uh, trimester. So we'd have to do a more deep dive analysis to see which of those uh, are truly teratogenic and were used in the period of risk. Next slide. Um, reassuringly, our rates of stillbirth, low birth weight, and neonatal death are very similar to that reported by the Western Cape uh, DHIS, which is encouraging 
to uh, uh, and suggest that our, our, our ascertainment of adverse birth outcomes is fairly good. We haven't yet completed uh, capturing all the stillbirth examinations into a red cap database that will also capture the congenital anomalies. And so I haven't presented that data as yet. Next slide. But um, if we do it, uh, this was just a very basic risk analysis looking at protease inhibitors and the risk of low birth weight preterm delivery and stillbirth. And as um, has been reported um, in other studies, we also found an association between protease inhibitor based ART. Uh, during pregnancy and the risk of low birth weight, which is reassuring in our ability in that it, uh, it means that we can use this data to uh, look at um, uh, signals from other sites and also to do and validate those in our population and also look at si potentially new signals. Next slide. So we, um, Based on experience with other birth defect surveillance systems, there's clearly a need for us to look beyond the birth period if we want to look for congenital malformations. And the Provincial Health Data Center is able to provide us with ICD codes, uh, Q codes, which denote a congenital malformation in the, in the client, uh, as well as a perinatal problem identification uh, codes, uh, suggesting a congenital malformation as a cause of a, a perinatal death. So that information together with the information from the maternity case record, uh, referral facility folder review, stillbirth examination forms, and in due course, fetal medicine scans um, and uh, genetic consults will be combined to give us a more comprehensive understanding of the congenital anomaly rates of our cohort. We have done most of this, but we are still working on building that um, triangulation, triangulated approach to getting um, better ascertainment of these birth outcomes. Next slide. So if I look at neural tube defects, um, the reported prevalence in the literature in South Africa ranges from 0.998 per thousand um, live and stillbirths and uh, 0.76 in the Western Cape uh, by colleagues uh, who published from Stellenbosch. The Q codes were extremely helpful, especially those at one year in identifying um, congenital malformations, neural tube defects, particularly in live births, but not very helpful at this stage for, uh, for anencephaly and, uh, and fatal neural tube defects probably because we haven't, um, we haven't done a recent um, pull of the PIP data into the PHDC. But what was useful was that the maternity module, which is the registry data, was able to add uh, additional cases of congenital uh, neural tube defects to the provincial health Q codes. So once we have, this is really just an incomplete um, analysis because we're still going to add in the stillbirth data, but it is encouraging that our numbers are approaching the, the anticipated or the expected rates seen in, in the literature. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, the registry is able to uh, provide good ascertainment of medicinal exposures during um, especially antiretrovirals. We have moderately high rates of gestational ultrasounds, which allows for better gestational dating, low rates of loss to follow-up, and, uh, and comparable adverse birth outcome rates uh, uh, compared to official statistics. Our congenital order detection requires triangulation of the data for complete ascertainment particularly in the absence of dedicated surveillance staff to do this. And so this platform could serve as a useful hypothesis generation and validation tool for the local population. Um, we also can, what's useful about this model is that it allows us to look at not just ARVs, but other therapies that are commonly prescribed in pregnancy. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ushma, for a fantastic presentation. And you're getting lots of virtual applause, Ushma. Um, I don't see any burning questions um, of clarity for Ushma's presentation in the chat room. And I think that was a, a very good place to actually lead us into our broader discussion um, for this afternoon. Um, so I think let me welcome Professor Andrew Bull, um, who will chair the discussion. And I'm sure most of you already know that Andrew is a renowned public health medicine specialist with the Western Cape Provincial Department of Health and Professor of Public Health Medicine at the University of Cape Town. He currently provides oversight for the Provincial Health Data Center in the Provincial Department of Health and has a longstanding involvement in routine HIV data. And Andrew will be joined in the discussion by two renowned colleagues in the field of HIV, who both likely need no introduction, but nonetheless, we'd like to welcome Professor Amina Goga, who is a pediatric pulmonologist at the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health in the University of Pretoria, and also director of the South African Medical Research Council HIV Prevention Research Unit, and Dr. Yogan Pillay, who is the country director of the Clinton Health Access Initiative in South Africa and senior director for universal health coverage. He's formerly the deputy director general of health in the Department of Health South Africa. Um, it's a real honor to have um, such um, discussions of such high caliber. A warm welcome um, to Andrew, Amina, and Jürgen. It's um, wonderful to have you here today. If I could ask you just to switch your cameras on and unmute, and Andrew, I'll hand over to you, and I will also keep an eye on the chat for any questions or discussion points that emerge there. Um, and just to remind everyone that while we do have discussions, um, the reason we have this format um, of um, Zoom meeting is so that everybody can participate. So we really welcome your comments, your questions, and your discussion, and would like this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so over to you, Andrew. Thank, thanks, Nisha, and greetings, everyone. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see. Yeah, you. Great. Yeah, perfect. So um, uh, I wasn't uh, planning to 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 say a lot up front. I, I saw myself more as a chair, but uh, so I'm going to hand over immediately to our um, to our, dis our um, guest discussants. Um, maybe first, uh, Amina uh, talking to the. Um, uh, PMTCT, I think you've led some of the most robust uh, studies on unbiased estimates of vertical transmission. And I wondered if you would like to uh, kick off with some other, uh, comments or additional questions to the presenters. No, thanks so much. And thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Nisha, for the invitation. Um, I think what's really been really useful this afternoon is to have everything put in one place. Um, so we had the talk uh, by Lee about modeling. Um, and that was followed by Faith's talk about how to look at uh, NHLS data and routine data and the probabilistic linkages and the synthetic cohorts. Um, and then Alexa's very good example of um, how to create actionable cascades using routine data and then uh, Ushma's pregnancy exposure register. And I guess the question is, um, these are extremely valuable. And I think if we're trying to understand the who, how, what, where, why, and when of vertical transmission, um, using these different sources of data will be extremely valuable. Um, but the question is, how do we galvanize them and use them um, or test them in different settings? Uh, at the moment, they're being used in the Western Cape and that's great. And uh, do we need to also have a, a kind of a matching province that's uh, quite different, so maybe uh, more rural, and is there transferability of some of these systems? And then secondly, as we look at some of the routine data, um, is it that we get the tip of the iceberg? So what's left out and how significant is it? Because do we see the good or the better um, outcomes? Um, through these routine data sets and are we missing a huge lot or can we say that in South Africa much of it is all captured within the routine health uh, system and so because we tap into so many different data sets ultimately we will get a true or, or truer picture um, of what's going on in the country and so I think those are some of the initial questions. Um, I think if we look at the data that are that the data sets that are available, 
uh, what really struck me is that there are two parts to this. You know, the one is how can we improve patient care? And I think that what Alexa presented is, it was so neat, you know, this actionable cascade at the individual level using um, the episode algorithms, and that can be used to improve patient care, I thought, but maybe if you could just expand on that and clarify whether that is true. And then you have the other set, which are more kind of aggregate data, looking at the NHLS, the pregnancy, pregnancy exposure registry, and then modeling, which can be used to look at either national outcome model, uh, monitoring or monitoring at uh, provincial or district level. I know, Lee, you had some reservations about the provincial applicability of the models. So maybe just to talk about those aspects as well. So I think there are quite a few things that I threw out. Um, so three things about do you, how to use them, the transferability, what is left out, and then where to use them, you know, the different levels and what impact they could have. So that's just to start off with Nisha and, and Andrew. Thanks. Um, sure. So, so I mean, maybe I'll just answer the transferability question. I think I probably have the greatest visibility of that. My, my feeling is that um, most of these are um, uh, data sources that are, that are common nationally. It's really a question of um, uh, digitization and coverage as to how useful um, these are. Um, I think we often don't make a start because we know that our coverage is incomplete, but you almost need to make a start to drive the advocacy to get the higher coverage. So it's a bit of chicken, uh, chicken and egg. And I think there are, there's quite a few places where there's a, a fair amount of um, medicine information coming in digitally. Certainly chronic medicines are, are, are well recorded uh, uh, those that are prepackaged at least, um, where the NHLS data are equally available in other provinces as they are um, in the Western Cape, uh, where there's um, a unique identifier that's available in primary care and some hospitals. It may not be perfect or perfectly implemented, but, but certainly the fundamentals are in place. Um, and birth registries, and uh, electronic birth registries emerging. So, um, you know, maybe finding a, a one or two sentinel locations through which um, a, a data consolidation approach could be um, uh, uh, spearheaded in other provinces, I think is, is definitely, I, I believe it's definitely feasible because the data sources are the same, ultimately. And I wonder, Alexa, uh, if you want to just uh, answer Amina's question about the, uh, the actionability, um, uh, how, um, uh, the extent to which these data uh, can be used as a, as a near real-time system. Uh, you know, the example that you showed at the end, is that feasible and, and, and uh, where in the system that could it be used? Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Amina, for your question. Um, yeah, so I think it is, it's really quite an actionable system if we get the right people using it and it becomes entrenched as, as a method of use. And I think that's the, the hardest part um, for this because we have all this data. And in fact, the alert probably should have gone out um, at the mother's booking visit where her viral load was not suppressed and she was on, you know, a dodgy tick of her regimen and, and was pregnant. And maybe that's when they could have had a, a conversation with the patient to try and um, um, check that they're taking their meds and that kind of thing. So at the moment, we are trying to roll out various alerts. And with that comes a lot of technical difficulty, making sure the alerts go to the right people um, and that we don't frustrate people with giving them work that they didn't need to do. Um, so there's there's many sides to the coin, um, but I think it's we're making steps to towards a, a good change and hopefully people will engage and be... Um, okay with us in the beginning while we while we work out all the the niggles <laughs> yeah thanks yeah thanks yeah thanks then i wonder the tip of the iceberg question um maybe to observe uh, lee you you've estimated uh four percent close to four percent vertical transmission in the western cape with a large proportion of it presumed to be postnatal DHIS probably estimates with the PCRs up to 10 weeks, 1%. So that's quite a gulf. Um, and I think we managed to demonstrate uh, from, from uh, person level data, uh, just over two, you know, just, just over 2%. Um, 
what's the plausibility of there being the same again that we haven't identified that are due to postnatal transmission, uh, probably in women who were negative at birth, who've then had um, uh, uh, seroconversion and breastfeeding transmission. Thanks, Andrew. So I, I think you've, you've kind of answered the question yourself, but I mean, I completely agree with, um, with what Amina was suggesting that our routine data systems might only be kind of picking up the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, at least in the early sort of um, first two years of life, I think often these kids do eventually develop symptoms, but it's often only later in childhood um, that, that we pick them up. So they do eventually end up in our routine data, but not in the sort of early postnatal period, uh, which is when the monitoring is most intensive. Um, so yeah, I, I think our, our, our modeling is definitely suggesting that there is a, a large undiagnosed um, pediatric HIV population that is a result of that um, um, maternal seroconversion during breastfeeding and the high associated um, mother-to-child transmission rates um, during acute HIV infection. Thanks. Um, th th thanks very much, Lee. Um, I wonder if we can uh, flip to Jürgen, who um, has been the steward, who was the steward of the PMTCT program from the very first PMTCT pilots um, through to uh, universal access, and also has been the advocate for uh, pregnancy exposure registries um, for, for, uh, for a very long time um, in, in, in his previous role. So Jürgen, uh, we're very happy to have your um, input into the session um, and over to you for any comments and questions. Hello, thanks very much. I think uh, Amina has given a really nice summary that links and ties in the uh, various presentations. So I won't, I won't do that, but I've got some specific questions uh, to uh, you know, each of the speakers, which I'll, and, I'll be, and I'll just leave it at one uh, person. Lee, uh, the, uh, the Tembisa data, um, I know it's fairly widely used for a range of purposes. What do you think we can use it for that it currently isn't being used for? You know, what purposes can it serve other than what we're currently using it for? Uh, so that we can uh, maximize the use of all the hard work you're doing. Oh, Faith, thanks very much for, for your presentation. Uh, I must say, um, your pessimism about eliminating vertical transmission is probably on the mark, but uh, not very encouraging for a Friday afternoon. Um, the question I have for you is, I know you, you, you put some caveat around the limitations of the data that you presented given the source data, but on the risk factors, um, the short duration on art, less than 25 years of age, and viral loads less than 500 at first antenatal. Do you think that your, your results are generalizable enough for us to use that in some kind of programmatic way? Um, the related question, which is really to everyone, is should we be trying to eliminate vertical transmission in South Africa? And if so, what should the threshold be for South Africa? I know with, with UNAIDS and uh, UNICEF, we've tried over the last number of years to come up with something that we were in agreement with, and we, I think we failed. So if the intention is elimination, what should it mean for South Africa? And what would be, based on your presentations, what should be the single most important thing we should do? Uh, can I ask whether or not the scale up that was launched in 2020 is actually going to happen? Uh, and who's, who's driving it? And is it necessary? Um, for Alexa, um, viral load suppression during and post, uh, postpartum in the Western Cape, you know, is it being monitored at the, uh, at the facility level? And how are you monitoring whether or not it's being uh, being monitored. And yeah, I mean specifically viral loads. Great, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, thanks, Jürgen. So I think maybe we can go in the, in the order of presentation. Uh, Lee, Faith, uh, and Alexa Oshma. Thanks, Jürgen, for that question. Um, it's a really good question. I think um, 
you asked sort of what, what are the purposes for which Timbees can be used, which is not currently being used. Um, and I think one of the one of the gaps really is around um, preventing HIV in the HIV negative mothers. You know, our programs focus so much on the HIV positive mothers, but we don't do enough to keep the HIV negative mothers negative. Um, and it's something that the model is very well set up to do. We can evaluate the, the effect of programs like PrEP and um, encouraging higher levels of condom usage and more regular HIV testing. Those are all strategies we can evaluate using our model, um, but there hasn't really been much um, interest or there haven't been many requests, shall we say, for, for those kind of outputs from our model. Um, although they would go a long way towards uh, reducing maternal HIV incidence and hence reducing mother to child transmission. So for me, I think that's one of the big gaps in terms of um, an area where our, our model is not being used to, to the extent that it could be. Thanks. Over to you, Fifth. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Um, so thank you for the question. So for me, regarding um, uh, predictors of maternal viral load decline and who we should be focusing on, I think for me, I think we need to be um, targeting younger moms uh, because we conducted some analysis where we looked at uh, patient level data and we saw that um, younger moms are driving most of the transmissions. So I think the program really needs to focus on um, moms who come into the program who are less than 25 years of age. And then uh, regarding uh, maternal, viral loads, maternal viral load threshold, I think um, we can get all women to, to suppress to less than 50 copies per mil, which is required for EMTCT. And the program just really needs to focus on um, ensuring that mothers are retained in care during pregnancy, the postpartum period and monitoring continues. And there needs to be systems to ensure that, to, to track these mothers uh, during care. And um, in terms of, uh, I think we need to invest in unique identifiers to try and link mother baby pairs so that, um, they, they are monitored correctly whilst they are, whilst they are accessing care within the, the PMTCT program. Uh, thank, thanks, Faith. Um, Alexa? Hi, um, thanks for your questions. Um, the first one on the viral load suppression during um, and postpartum. So we have all the viral loads for all, all patients um, in the HIV cascade and in, in the maternal cascade. And uh, my colleagues have currently been working to pull together the viral loads done um, kind of quite close to pregnancy, just before conception, um, during pregnancy and, and after. Uh, we're not currently using these data in our um, PhDC reports. Andrew might know if it's used in any of the DHIS style reports, although I didn't see um, any indicators for this in the subset that I looked at. But there is definitely a drive to start using it more. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't actually include some preliminary analysis um, of viral load suppression um, it tabulated with the infant outcomes. And then on the other question about should we be trying to eliminate um, vertical transmission, I think um, one of the things we should probably be doing generally is to really just improve um, art coverage, especially amongst pregnant women. There are a subset of patients who are needing to be in, in care for, for us long enough duration that if we can keep them on art um, and, and monitor their suppression, that will help. And then also just in general, um, encouraging women to access serv uh, services for their pregnancy as early as possible and to continue um, to be in like acting, uh, accessing services uh, during breastfeeding and that kind of thing so that they can be actively monitored. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. And may maybe when we get to the general um, discussion, if any of the service um, colleagues were are in a position to comment on postnatal care. Um, I think one of the issues around monitoring viral load postnatally is whether there's a service platform in which to land those reports besides trying to get them to the very distributed art um, uh, program for H for, um, uh, for H. Yeah. Um, but 
monitoring uh, viral loads and also monitoring postpartum women for um, seroconversion, which is one of the issues that um, people are discussing in the chat. And finally, over to you, Ushma. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks, Yogan, for that question. Um, so, this, the, firstly, the registry has been launched in KwaZulu Natal and Gauteng. Uh, and in fact, I think enrollment started this week in most of the sites. And um, it, 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 it's part of a bigger initiative. So, as I mentioned, and it really relates to Amina's question as well about how it is going to work in another province, is we've adapted the system so that we've firstly incorporated much of the health system strengthening on the national platform. So, we are, you know, so the plan is to really. Um, firstly, there's a new module in the sexual reproductive health training material in the country for improving uh, surface examinations and obtaining accurate and appropriate drug histories from pregnant women um, as part of routine care. We've developed an app that will allow for the detection of birth defects and the reporting of birth defects at point of care, including the you, um, taking consented photographs through that app in a secure way. So a lot of the, the, the re, you know, repurposing, revising of the approach that's used in the Western Cape has been to do with addressing um, the transferability of the registry into the other provinces. So it really is important uh, that, you know, that we, and of course with COVID that's, that there has been some delays with ethics approvals, et cetera, which is why it's taken a bit of time. But I think it's really important. Firstly, because um, we're seeing questions about the safety of COVID vaccinations, PrEP and other dr uh, drug exposures, MDR, TB drugs. And so we've really tried to build a platform here that um, will allow for surveillance of other interventions, not just Dolutegrava, which is what it started off as being. So I think it is an important platform that we need to keep um, available um, as we move forward, not just provincially, but nationally. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rishma. So uh, just to come back to Amina and Jürgen, are there any uh, second round uh, clarifications or additional questions or comments? I thought Amina would go first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Jürgen. I think from my side, just some of the results were really interesting. And I think the one of the things that you mentioned was that um, if you look at the Western Cape data, the MTCT looks pretty much similar to the national average and the ART coverage as well. Um, and I would have expected it to be slightly different and maybe slightly lower. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Is it is it to do with uh, something to do with the model um, or is it that uh, a lot of the Western Cape data goes into the national model and so it's kind of biased towards the Western Cape um, so maybe that for Faith uh, sorry for Lee um, and then for Faith I think your data on the, the case rate so the number of uh, new cases per 100,000 live births I think that's really important an important data to share and to take note of uh, nationally. And I wonder if you're going to continue to do these analyses um, because they are really useful. So, so maybe just to comment on that, it seems like it's really a lot of work. Um, so are you able to continue to do that? Um, so I think those are the two from my side for now, because uh, I think we want questions from others as well. <laughs> Thanks, I'll stop there. Uh, th uh, thanks, Amina. Uh, Jürgen, do you have any follow-ups? And then we can do one last round and then uh, go to the general discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I, I just want to pick up this issue about, you know, uh, following uh, these cohorts for a longer period. Um, you know, largely because of the fairly large uh, cohort that we have, that uh, infants and adolescents now who are both HIV exposed, um, aren't exposed, but uninfected. Now, who should be collecting this data? Um, is anyone collecting this data? And what, what do you think we could do to ensure that we consider the early indications that we have already 
of developmental issues, stunting, and, and, and a range of other uh, health, health conditions that are found in this cohort that's uh, both exposed, um, HIV exposed, as well as heart exposed, but uh, uninfected. Over. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Jürgen. So, so um, I think if Lee and Faith can answer the questions from uh, Amina, and then I'm actually going to ask some of the uh, uh, respondents on the in the in the chat to to maybe ask uh, respond to your HEU HEU questions because there are some experts on the um, uh, uh, on the call. So, uh, Lee, then um, then Faith. Thanks, uh, Amina, for the question. Um, so to answer your question around why Western Cape is similar to national, I mean, I think it looks similar when you just aggregate across everything, but I think there, there are many different factors that uh, can account for interprovincial differences. Um, so for example, there are differences in uh, breastfeeding durations and breastfeeding patterns, um, which, um, differ quite substantially across the provinces. There's also differences in terms of adult ART coverage. And um, I think one of the points that was made earlier um, was, was that we, we are missing a lot of, um, uh, or a lot of uh, pregnant HIV positive women are not getting onto ART during pregnancy. Um, and um, this, this is kind of consistent with what we've, we've found in Timbisa, at least compared to other provinces. Um, and so I think the, uh, the, the lower ART coverage in pregnancy is kind of um, offset by the, the shorter average duration of, of breastfeeding in, in Western Cape, so that um, overall the mother to child transmission rate is, is not actually that much different from the national average. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question, Amina, is that th there are several um, competing factors um, which kind of offset one another and that um, mean that the, the net mother to child transmission in, in Western Cape is not that different from the national average. Thanks. Thank you for the question, Amina. So yes, we are able to um, continue with uh, providing this uh, analysis and, and, and reporting, continue with the reporting, uh, and we can share the data widely. But uh, as I indicated during the presentation, that the accuracy of these estimates, um, they, they, they are largely dependent on the accuracy of the algorithms within the NHLS to deduplicate uh, the data. So if we had a unique identifier, we would probably be um, reporting on more accurate estimates but we are able to, to continue with uh, the analysis and we are more than happy to share the data, the results rather. Uh, great, Th thanks very much, Faith. So um, I'm just wondering if Amy is still on the call um, to respond to, the, to Jürgen's question about the long-term follow-up of HIV um, uh, exposed um, uninfected and, and ARV exposed um, uh, children. Yes, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, for the opportunity to respond to that. And thanks very much, Jürgen, for the question. Um, so, I mean, I think this is, you know, really big, big starting to become a central um, um, piece on the agenda of ensuring that all children born to women living with HIV do survive and thrive and reach their potential. And, you know, in South Africa, it's at least one in four of all our children are now born to a mom with HIV and by far the majority of them exposed to ARV. So there's really a, a neutro um, and during fetal development. So there's really an imperative to understand um, the outcomes for these children and that we, we include them in, in monitoring the success of our program. I think there's a lot, um, actually, you know, that's being done in the, in the immediate term at the start of life. So with the pregnancy exposure registry sites, you know, we're going to, across the country, through the national um, um, pregnancy exposure registry projects, we're going to get a lot of really rich information to come on not just congenital anomalies, but birth outcomes um, and, you know, starting out life preterm and small for gestational age and with low birth weight impacts all the rest of the life course. So, so we're going to start to get a lot of rich information from that. But it would be really um, advantageous to see how we could potentially continue follow-ups of those cohorts in the, in the sentinel sites. Um, and I think that's potentially the strategy to use to get the longer term picture of these children is investing in a few sentinel sites across the country um, that can look at this. Um, 
there are, I think, opportunities that we haven't fully explored yet um, to leverage routinely collected data in terms of some of the, the later life outcomes and actually thinking particularly um, in Department of Health collaborating with Department of Education um, to understand actually whether there's a difference potentially in, 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 in the proportion of HEU children getting to school, entering school at appropriate ages, appropriate age um, progression through the grades um, um, could help to at least get a sense of the population level, whether these children are meeting um, the sort of their, their educational um, potential, or at least the very bare minimum of, of what we're expecting, and whether this is any different to unexposed children. I think the other sort of more detailed growth in your developmental assessments, um, at the moment, there isn't much routinely collected in the healthcare system um, to, to understand these outcomes, and that's where we're really going to need to invest in, in, in cohorts. So I think, as, as was shared in some some forums recently, I mean, the NIH and NICHD particularly has invested now in a number of cohorts um, to look longer term at these kids. And luckily, we are, are fortunate to have one of those cohorts um, becoming established and developed in the Western Cape to provide some of this longer term outcome data. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Amy. So now I've suggested that anybody who, who wants to um, uh, follow up on any of the discussion or ask any questions or make any comments, um, please, please raise hands using the, the function, or if you can't, unmute yourself and, and make yourself known. Um, in the absence, I will, I will direct a couple of, um, of, of questions. Um, so I, I'm not seeing any, Nisha, if I miss any, will you let me know? Um, I wondered, uh, Linda Gale, you've made a few comments in the chat. I wonder if you want to talk to them. Is still on the call? Uh, no. And then um, I also wanted to ask uh, maybe Emma, uh, Amy, you've just spoken, and maybe Lee to talk to your experience at the other sites, um, the other pregnancy exposure registry sites. Um, if you want to make any comment about where where, where you're at and what your uh, what your outlook is. Um, maybe, I mean, Ushma spoke, uh, you know, I, I, I'm at the, at the Google Eighty site, which I can, I can speak to, but perhaps, uh, if Lee fairly still on the call, she can chat about, um, some of the Gauteng sites. Uh, uh, maybe she's, is. she's not on the call in, oh, she is still on the call, but, um, she may have stepped away. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I find I suppose one of the the strengths that we've we've managed to do with the Google Eighty site is that we are more or less now completely integrated into the into the routines of the clinic, and and there's there is some, uh, you know, the, the the staff are based are based at the site at Google Eighty, and then we have a site at Mowbray Maternity Hospital, and we visit Hortescue Hospital intermittently, and um, and they uh, certainly um, I'm I'm confident at the primary care site, which is where we start enrolling people for the pregnancy reg exposure registry in, in uh, Google Air 2, that, that we, you know, that our ascertainment is quite, uh, is quite tight. And um, more recently, uh, with the, the sort of nesting the, the pregnancy registry uh, within the sort of advantages of the data center, I feel that there's, there's evidence which has been, you know, on, on display as in the, in the last couple of weeks that, that the registry data can can um, enhance and validate the, the PHDC data, and the PHDC can can find, you know, can can mop up our missing outcomes because we we don't have people based at all the sites in the province where where babies can possibly um, be born, and I'm very reassured by by the the similarity between the results that we're finding just sort of from broad look analysis of the pregnancy registry with with what's picked up on the the district health information services and within the phdc so that's been very reassuring in terms of our congenital anomalies we still um it's still sort of early days there we we're looking at that in in much more detail and so we have a folder review um and COVID sort of upended that so we we currently uh, trying to 
to uh, back capture the, the folders of the congenital anomalies. That takes a bit longer because they, they're quite complicated medical cases. And so you need uh, people with medical insight uh, doing that. But I've, I've certainly been reassured. And I mean, we can, we, we already have used the, the sort of data available to look at um, INH and sodium valproate exposures uh, with PrEP coming on board where you giving ARVs to, to women who are, are not living with HIV, who are HIV negative. And certainly with, with the, the upswing of interest in, in vaccines in pregnancy, I think um, sentinel side pregnancy registries are, are well positioned to, uh, to be able to, to identify a large signals of concern um, based on routinely collected data. Thanks a lot. Yeah, good. Uh, thanks, Emma. That's a very uh, encouraging outlook. Um, uh, is there anybody who wants to comment a little bit about the serv serv service issues related to postnatal transmission? That seemed to have been a theme that's come through from the vertical transmission discussions. Um, I don't see anybody's hands up or unmuting. I think um, that's a really important um, area that we, we haven't quite gotten around. And for many years, we've been speaking about integration and um, kind of strengthening the postnatal care platform. But it doesn't seem to me like we've really clinched what we need to do. Um, and apart from making sure that children um, attend their visits, the most important thing seems to be to, to have some kind of identifier to ensure there's continuity of care and that every HIV exposed child is known to be exposed um, and receives the correct um, care and monitoring and that every negative mother gets a repeat uh, or gets repeat HIV testing postnatally. And I don't know if anybody here has, you know, some kind of model that has been tested or some kind of, you know, has anybody tried to do this to boost that postnatal care platform? And, you know, do you have experiences that can be um, extended to other areas of the country where this is really not happening? Um, and I don't really have an answer except to say that, you know, we need to, to start boosting this platform. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I see Andrea, you have your your hand up, and you are you do have you do have a service perspective. Uh, I don't know if, I'm not sure that's what you want to talk to. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously. So, if a large, a huge percentage of the transmissions are happening postnatally and breastfeeding, um, then I mean, one thing we've sort of discussed in terms of the alert is an alert for women who don't um, link back to care and restart ARVs um, postpartum as sort of a simple intervention, but then um, HIV testing with infant vaccination since early vaccination rates are quite um, high, or again, making sure that um, at all those vaccination, um, linking the sort of ARV clinic to where the um, baby's infant care is done um, so that it's a sort of a integrated um, visit because I think they're still quite separate. And so, um, yeah, any opportunity to make sure that women are still taking ARVs are suppressed or are getting tested anytime the baby is seen, um, whether it could be, yeah, I think is quite, will be, would be quite useful. Uh, th thanks, Andrea. Um, I saw Boma Bushley, which I think is, um, is that Ushma? Good afternoon, Andrew. It's Patti. Oh, Good afternoon. Oh, Patti. Oh, but I didn't, yes. uh, I didn't see uh, Patti. That I would also like to hear your, um, your perspectives on the KZN registry. That'd be great. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. But my hand was up for, to talk into the postnatal transmissions. Uh, especially during breastfeeding, what we're seeing in KZN. Most of the transmissions are not necessarily from clients that were already on ART. It's from clients that are seroconverting during breastfeeding period. And um, we, we've tried to then monitor 
to increase the uptake for testing during the breastfeeding period by having a provincial indicator to monitor testing during breastfeeding and then the positivity rate. And with that, we're able to then see, although it is declining, but most of the women that seroconverts during the breastfeeding period, they transmit. And for that, then it then talks into us strengthening the provision of PrEP during the breastfeeding period, but not necessarily breastfeeding, also looking into the antenatal period. So it's one area that we would like to focus on and work on with the support from UNICEF and MRC to see if we can strengthen and working around that to see what can assist us to strengthen that aspect of putting that additional uh, prevention in terms of new HIV cases during the breastfeeding period. Then moving into the pregnancy registry in KZN, uh, for now we've not yet started, but we are ready. We near finally hoping that by end of the month, we will start with the collection of data in the three sites. And the uh, Prince machine is also ready to start. So we're hoping that we'll be moving on and we hope that we will get some robust data with, uh, with our HIV prevalence in the province. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank, thanks very much, Ati. Um, uh, Ahmad? And then Hi, Pauline? So, so with the, the changing guidelines uh, whereby all children should be having rapid diagnostic testing done at 18 months of age, what we've noticed uh, at NICD is that there's an increase in the number of HIV PCR positives between 18 and, and 24 months of age. And it just raises interesting questions in terms of who those, those children are and in terms of their, their HIV exposure history. And I think there's obviously uh, opportunities to, to, to look into that in further detail. Yeah, um, I'm, I hope Alexa is listening and uh, <clears throat> is trying to, 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 to look at that. Um, uh, thanks for that comment. Uh, Pauline? Um, you're still muted. Uh, Pauline, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Um, still, still not Pauline. If you want to just type your comment in the chat, um, and at the same time, I will um, just to start wrapping up. We're three minutes from 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 the end. So um, my sense is that we've seen fairly good uh, concurrence between what, uh, what um, uh, Lee was presenting from the modeling um, uh, and what we are able to show from routine data. And while there are differences between the DHIS, our routine individuated data and the modeling, the, we have a, there were fairly uh, cogent uh, 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 explanations put forward as to what what's underlying those differences so to largely explainable um, differences um, and then uh, on the um, there was quite a lot of discussion about the the gap with postnatal transmission and some discussion about service 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 approaches to try and address that uh, including um, opportunities for testing um, retesting a woman through the postnatal period um, I didn't hear much discussion about dedicated postnatal services. I, mean, I know some years ago there was a move away from, uh, from, from those in some provinces. Um, and then quite, uh, quite reassuring uh, prospects for the workability of the pregnancy exposure registry sites and uh, quite positive outlooks uh, and, um, and uh, uh, a, th a thought that they, they may be fit for purpose for monitoring um, exposed uh, uninfected children from for much longer. Um, 
I see that Lee is back. Uh, Lee, we were just kind of just getting a, a readout from the other pregnancy exposure registry sites as to where they're at. I don't know if you have for, for 30 seconds, if you want to just uh, uh, comment. Yes, and I apologize, Andrew. I just had to take an urgent call at the time. Um, so yeah, we are really hoping to get started um, very soon. I think the team is starting with the pilot, well, with, with sorry, Jai, we're starting with the um, pilot on Monday. Um, the other sites uh, at Rahima Musa and at Barra um, have actually already started. Um, and then I think, yeah, very shortly after that, we'll, we'll really be able to start implementing. Um, I think everyone is, is very excited. Um, you know, obviously it just adds, uh, diversity in terms of, of population and, and really increases the, the sample size just around um, some of these exposures and, and outcomes um, for women and their infants. Thanks. Uh, great, great, Thank, thanks Lee. So um, are there any last uh, questions or comments, uh, including from the discussants? I think, Andrew, just to say thank you for this forum, because it's not often that we're able to get together to look at um, vertical transmission um, and to review some of the different sources of data um, that uh, we're now able to put together, because the landscape has changed since a few years ago. Um, and so I think thank you. And I think, I think today's discussion has highlighted that there's so many layers to this discussion. Um, and it's difficult to, to address all of them in one sitting. And so I wondered if there would be some kind of follow-up, um, even if it's not immediately. Um, but at some point, um, maybe this year, one more or otherwise early next year, just to see where we are um, and to, to kind of chart our way forward. Because I think as a country, we, we really seem to be lagging behind on the the vertical transmission, and we seem to think that we're doing well. Um, and we have done remarkably, but there's still lots of unfinished business. Um, and so I think just to say thank you for arranging this uh, and looking forward to more. Um, so thanks so much, everyone. And thanks, Nisha, as well. Uh, uh, th thanks very much, uh, Amina. Uh, it's a perfect uh, wrap up. So just in terms of the future uh, seminars, we wanted to have one more this year. And maybe, I don't know, Nisha, if you want, we're going to cover the next topic um, or not. Um, but maybe if people have strong, uh, strong thoughts about which other areas uh, would benefit from a kind of a deep dive of trying to triangulate routine data with modeling and, um, and uh, um, kind of what the opportunities are for better insights from routine data, then, then let us know. I know one of the suggestions has been to look at advanced HIV disease. Um, we've looked... For those who weren't on the first seminar, we looked at general HIV treatment and the first one now done uh, HIV in pregnancy and vertical transmission and the other topic that that was on the on the roadmap was advanced HIV, but we were open to to any any suggestions. Um, and with and yeah, just feel free to contact Anisha or myself directly if you have suggestions. And with that back to you, Nisha, I don't know if there's any uh, uh, wrap up from your side. Um, no, thanks very much, Andrew, and a, a very special thank you to um, Andrew, Jürgen, and Amina, as well as everyone attending for engaging, asking pertinent questions, and contributing to the discussion. And uh, just a very big thank you to our presenters, again, Lee, Faith, Alexa, and Ushma for their ex excellent and insightful presentations. Um, so as um, Andrew mentioned, we are hoping to have one more um, meeting in this series this year, um, tentatively on the 8th of October, again on a Friday afternoon. We will send a calendar invite once the program and speakers are confirmed, but just to echo what Andrew said, if you have any suggestions for topics and speakers, um, we'd uh, love to hear from you. And, and thank you, Amina, for your point on having a follow-up to this one as well. Um, and we look forward to meeting up again and having a fruitful, robust discussion. Um, thank you all for availing yourself on a Friday afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, all.